Hello everyone, welcome to the 14th lecture of our series on Ferric Fed Book 2017. In today's lecture, we will look at section 12, measurement and valuation. I think now we are getting to the business end of the Ferric Fed Book. And as a result, what I will do now is I'll spend a little bit more time on each clause because I think it's important we delve into a little bit more detail than we normally do. So we will look at a total of four clauses, clauses 12.1 through to clause 12.4. So the first clause is works to be measured, clause 12.1. Feel free to pause to read through the whole thing. So what this clause basically says is that the works must be measured in line with the contract. So in most cases, in many cases, what happens is the works that we do are to be measured. So we will get paid on how much work we have done, how many block, how many square meters of block work have we done, how many square meters of paint have we done, etc, etc. So once we finish our works on site, let's say we have completed a certain section of the works, we as contractors are required to give the engineer a notice of seven days that, hey engineer, please come and inspect our works. Let us measure the works that we have done jointly. So once this date and time for this uh, remeasurement or measurement of works is set, we as contractors must make sure that we send a representative to meet the engineer on site to take these measurements together. If we fail to send our representative and the engineer shows up, he does the measurements. If our representative was not present at the time of measurement, the measurements that the engineer has taken will be deemed as correct. Now, if the measurements have been taken together and on site there is a dispute we don't like how the engineer is measuring or we think the measurement is less etc etc in case there's a dispute within 14 days we should formally notice uh, notify the engineer otherwise if we fail to notify the engineer we will uh, be deemed to have accepted the engineer's measurements what the implications of this clause are is that we as contractors must make sure that we ensure our attendance at the time of the measurement. If there are disagreements, if there are disputes, then clause 7.1 gets triggered, which was engineer's determination. For example, this disagreement, this dispute takes a lot of time to resolve and we've already done our work. What FIDIC requires the engineer to do is he can proceed with a provisional valuation until the final amount is settled. So what this ensures, what the FIDIC Red Book ensures is that we do not wait endlessly for all our money. Maybe there's a small portion of the money that is under dispute. So until this little bit is uh, resolved, the overall sum that is agreed on or the engineer's valuation, which is, I don't know, 90, 95% of the work that can be pros processed as part of our interim payment certificates. So this shows how fair FIDIC Red Book is to us contractors. Let's take an example. For example, we needed to measure how much excavation we had done. The date for measurement was uh, set. For some reason, our representative did not show up. The engineer went ahead and took the measurements. And as a result, the measurements of the engineer were uh, deemed as accurate. We might send notifications of disputes, claims, etc., etc. in this case. However, these are unlikely to be entertained because the clause and the contract requires us to show up on the date of measurement. Clause 12.2 is method of measurement. This might look like a very small clause, but trust me, this is one of the most tricky clauses in the whole Fiddick Red Book. Uh, give me a second, I'll explain this. So what this clause uh, states is that the method of measurement, how things are to be measured, should be defined in the contract data. If the method of measurement is not specified in detail, then the method of measurement, which was used in the calculation process for the bill of quantities, that method of measurement will be used. The next bit I'm going to read is very, very important. Unless otherwise stated, measurements must reflect the net actual quantities. So, for example, you are supplying concrete, you will not get paid for how many trucks you supplied. You will get paid for the quantity of concrete in our foundation or our walls or our slab. This is very, very important. This does not allow for anything that might happen, bulking, shrinkage of concrete or similar other things. The implication is the contractor is paid for what is actually constructed, what can be seen, what can be measured, not what is delivered. 
what this also does is it prevents disputes we contractors can go like oh no i have delivered 20 trucks of concrete the measurement is incorrect uh, there was bulking there was something happened to the concrete there was some wastage no none of that this prevents this dispute because we will only get paid for what is seen what is visible and what is measurable so it is very important for us and specifically our quantity surveys to take accurate measurements when we are submitting our interim payment certificates. Let's understand this a little bit more with this example. Uh, the text is a generic example. Let's look at the next bit. You feel free to read through this uh, text. So what you're looking at on your screens is a layout of the excavation. So we have excavated the yellow portion that you see and the orange por portion that you see on your screens. However, our actual foundation is the orange portion only. The yellow portion that you see is for the slope so that the whole thing doesn't collapse. It is for probably some working space. But when it comes to the time of payment, what we will get paid for is only the orange portion. The engineer will not pay us for the yellow portion, the slopes, etc, etc. So what this entails is it is very, very important when we are estimating the project, when we are preparing the tender, we should account for the extra excavation or extra wastage or anything else that we feel might happen during construction, we should factor all of that into the unit rates of the actual foundation in this case. I think this example should make it sufficiently clear. Clause 12.3 is valuation of the work. Very detailed clause. Feel free to pause and read through the whole thing. Clause 12.3 basically sets out how we will get paid. So we have discussed in the previous two clauses the uh, quantities how they will be measured now there is a question of how much is this thing worth normally most of it is covered in the boq we have a rate for each item in the boq and that rate will be applied however we might need to agree to a new rate if number one this line item is not in the boq the agreed unit rate is not available if the quantity of this item also increases or decreases by a substantial amount, it's normally 10%. If the quant So, for example, we had 10,000 cubic meters of concrete in our contract. Because of variations, because of changes, etc., etc., this quantity became 13,000 uh, cubic meters. So, in this case, the quantity has increased by more than 30%. So, in this case, us contractors and the engineer will need to sit down and agree to a new unit rate. Until such an agreement is reached, we discussed something similar in the previous clause also. Until we reach this agreement, the engineer is allowed to apply a provisional rate. Once again, in order not to delay our payments. For example, if the disagreement is we are claiming a cubic meter of concrete is, I don't know, let's say 1000 uh, dirhams and the engineer has said that no the cubic meter of concrete should cost 900 dirhams so the dispute is 100 dirhams so we can get paid for the 900 dirhams unit rate until the agreement on the remaining portion is reached so in this way our cash flow will not be impacted and we can continue with the works without impacting the project what are the implications of this clause the implications are that it protects us contractors as well as the employer and the engineer in case there are substantial adjustments to what the original tender documents and the contract documents said. This also gives us contractors a way to claim reasonably our costs. So what happens is, for example, there was an item that was not in the BOQ. For example, suddenly we were required to supply, I don't know, these mics. These were not in our BOQ. And what will be required is how it will be fair is we will be required to submit a quotation or an actual invoice for how much we paid for this mic and the engineer will pay us the actual value and also some overhead and profit so the engineer cannot be cheated we cannot say this mic costs a million dirhams as well as we are protected because we get paid our overhead and profit again if disputes arise it will go back to clause 3.7 engineers determination 
A simple example is, yeah, for example, we had 3000 square meters of paving in our bill of quantities. And when the works were executed, it was measured that 4200 cubic square meters of paving were done. So this is a massive increase, a 40% increase from the original quantities, which is greater than the allowed 10%. So in this case, what will happen is a new unit rate will be agreed and we will be paid as per the new unit rate. The last clause is clause 12.4 omissions. Very important. What this clause says is that when a part of the work, a part of our scope is removed as part of a variation, we are entitled to recover some costs if the omitted portion, the deleted section of the work was part of the original contract price. Number two, as a result of this deletion of scope, we will uh, lose money that we cannot recover anywhere else. Also, the cost that we are trying to claim for as a result of this omission, this cost should not be included anywhere else. We as contractors are required to provide complete substantiation in order to prove our case. I know this is a bit confusing. Let's understand it a little bit more uh, through the example. Let's look at the implications first. So what this clause does is it prevents the employer from removing items that are highly profitable to us. So it sort of protects the contractor. It also encourages us contractors to have our records and our estimation and our calculations, all of these ready and properly documented in order to uh, prove our case. Let's understand this better with this example. So for example, we are doing a high rise building and we have cladding works, the value of which in the BOQ is 1.2 million. Now this work is deleted from our scope and we do not have a separate line item for preliminaries. So what we have done as part of this BOQ is we have taken our preliminaries and distributed them across all line items in the BOQ. Now, when this line item is deleted, so are my preliminaries and I as a contractor am entitled to recover these preliminaries. So I will submit a claim to the engineer explaining my case, proving that I do not have these costs covered anywhere else and it is very likely that this uh, claim or this request for variation will be entertained and we will get paid the portion of the works and the portion of the costs that we have actually incurred. I hope that was clear enough. That concludes section 12. We will be back with section 13 very very soon. Take care of yourselves. Until then, happy building.